Most of you know me really well and know that I spent a year as a student missionary in Korea. It was a really wonderful time of service and discovery, uh, cross-cultural education, of being away from home and living independently, having my own income and resources. It was a wonderful time of uh, growth for me spiritually. But it was also a time where you were away from and isolated from lots and lots of people that you had come to know as family and community and from my college. And so finding other student missionaries uh, was always a, a, a joy and a pleasure. And it was a very small group of us, but it nonetheless somehow managed to become a dating pool. And I found myself a girlfriend from among the American missionaries. <laughs> We were in different cities, so we didn't see each other often. And uh, it was, it was a, a relationship that served at the time. But I came back to the United States and went to college, and she remained in Korea for a good four months yet. And during that time, it became apparent to me that uh, she was not to be the one. I had not yet met the one, you see. <laughs> came apparent to me that I, at some point or another this was going to come to an end and so as she thought of coming home I could not for the life of me figure out a good way to make this just be over you see so I, I fancied myself a nice guy and I thought I want to let her down easy we didn't have email back in those days that would have been the easiest we had fax machines right um, <laughs> But nobody had them in their homes. We had post-it notes, but we weren't in the same city or area. And in fact, when she was coming home, it was going to be Arizona, and I lived in California. And uh, we had telephones, but everybody's nobody wants to be broken up with over the phone. That's just tacky, right? Any of you old enough to remember when breaking up by phone was tacky? Okay, good, good. That's... So I decided that I would welcome her home and go visit her in Arizona and let her down easy and break up with her there. Good plan, right? It's going on the website, yeah. Maybe not. We'll see. It's being recorded anyway. Thank you, hon. Thank you. So um, <laughs> so I flew to Arizona and went to see this, this girlfriend of mine and, and visited with her and, and met her family. And it turns out that all of that process wasn't as clearly understood as I would have hoped. Uh, it didn't appear that I was showing up to end things. It appeared that I was showing up to welcome her home and, and see her after this four months that we'd, we'd been apart. So it was time, about time for me to come back to California, and I remember us uh, driving around some of the scenic areas around Scottsdale, and I started to talk about how this wasn't really working. And the conversation continued and continued, and this poor gal uh, just, I don't know whether she couldn't hear it or whether the setup of everything was so wrong that it just the framework was entirely not available to her or what. But I can remember trying to say a million different ways it's over without saying it's over. <laughs> it's, you know, it just seemed rude, right, to say, come on, I would say it's over. It was a six-hour breakup. <laughs> All right? I ended up feeling mad because she seemed so dense, right? I mean, how, how hard do I have to work at this, really? And that anger expressed itself in the form of tears, which confused her even further. Now, Ultimately, I got the message through because I did what I should have done in the first place. I said, we are not meant to be, this is over. You see, it was direct, 
clear. And it was, it was painful. We ended up uh, friends for a bit there at, at school. She ended up dating and marrying a wonderful guy. Um, and I hope she's doing well. I haven't been in touch with her. We're not even Facebook friends. So this can go on the website, and I'm not terribly worried about her finding this, especially since I haven't named her name. But um, I, why do I tell you this very sort of old personal story, you know? Uh, I tell it to you because sometimes we have a hard time getting through. We have a message. We have something we want to communicate to somebody. We have uh, a, a particular idea we need to get across, and we're very, very inefficient at it. And the message isn't understood, or the hearer is not receptive or the circumstances are such that our actions and or the way we've behaved confuse the hearer, you see. I share this with you because communication is an art, not a science. Because we each navigate this every day in what we share with those around us, what we communicate at work, what we try to accomplish. I know that we all have some ability to speak English in this room, and it's still the Tower of Babel because we ask for things that we don't get. We speak and aren't heard. We, it just happens that way sometimes, yes? Go a different direction. I had parents who believed that they could bypass any attempt on our part, that is to say the three of us children, to manipulate them or to tell stories in ways that made us look particularly favorable or innocent, you see. So something would happen and we would start to tell a story and one of our parents might say, I don't want to hear it. Maybe you as a parent have uttered those words. I don't want to hear it. Save it for another day. The presumption was they knew exactly what had gone on and what we were trying to communicate and what we were trying to get into and out of, what sort of manipulations we might have up our sleeves. They were wise, but they weren't always right. Sometimes what we wanted to share as children was new information. Sometimes it was unadulterated truth about what really went down that caused the basement door bro a window to break or whatever the story would be. They weren't open to hearing the message. Punishments were meted out based on their misconceptions. Grave injustices were done <laughs> in the course of, of raising children. And I've probably perpetuated a few of those injustices. Maybe you have too. Communication, it's a tricky thing. Getting through, it's a difficult thing. You see, ever since Eden, when God said to Adam and Eve, we're no longer going to be able to meet like this. We're no longer going to be able to spend this time together. In fact, you're no longer going to be able to live in this garden. Ever since that time, God has been trying to get through to us. He's been trying to tell us a message. He's been trying to reestablish connection and relationship. And communication is tough. Communication sometimes fails. God's even been extremely creative about it if you look at the whole of biblical history. Very creative. And it's still tough sometimes for us to hear. Let's listen to our texts in light of that because I know as a person just sitting in a pew and hearing some of these passages, they seem dark, negative, judgmental, punitive, irrelevant sometimes. What do these passages really speak to? What do they help us understand about ourselves and our own relationship with one another and with God in the course of time? 
And so let's just take a quick look at them through those eyes and see if we can have a little empathy, a little understanding, gain a little wisdom. The call to worship was the proverb. The teaching of the wise is a fountain of life, turning a person from the snares of death. That's a powerful passage. Doesn't seem particularly negative just by itself, does it? The teaching of the wise is a fountain, and it turns us from all kinds of evil. Our goal in raising our children, in being followers of Jesus, in reading the Word ourselves, is to drink from fountains of wisdom, to be fountains of wisdom, and to to keep our children and our church family as a whole from great harm, to put a hedge around our community, to highlight morals and standards that help us govern how we're going to teach, how we're going to treat one another, how we're going to live in community, so that the greatest good can come, so that everybody might have a chance to fully mature in the love and grace of Jesus Christ. That's that's what we're trying to do. So the proverb sets forth something valuable, something interesting. The teaching of the wise is this fountain of life, turning us from the snares of death. God's judgment wins favor, but the way of unfaithfulness leads to destruction. And all who are prudent act with knowledge, but fools expose their folly. This passage reminds me of one of the funniest movies of all time. Maybe we won't post this one to the web, I don't know. Planes, trains, and automobiles. Those of you who've seen it know that there's a scene when John Candy is driving and they have fallen as- he has fallen asleep and they have spun down the off ramp and woken up, but they're facing up the off ramp and they think it's an on ramp. And they accelerate out of this foggy state up the off-ramp onto the freeway going the wrong direction of the flow of traffic. And a well-meaning couple in another vehicle on the other side of the freeway on the lane is going the same direction now as they are. They're on the proper side of the road. And they roll down their window and in chorus say, You're going the wrong way! And John Candy rolls down his window and listens out there and says, What? You're going the wrong way! Somebody's going to get killed! Wisdom, right? Oh, hello. (laughs) And John Candy says, to Steve Martin, how do they know where we're going? (laughs) And Steve Martin says, yeah, how do they know where we're headed? And so John Candy immediately assumes that they're drunk and starts mocking them. And then two trucks come down the two-lane road straight at them, and all of a sudden the meaning of the phrase, you're going the wrong way, becomes crystal clear. The trucks split just a little bit and the car goes right down the center and both sides of the car sideswipe the truck and they end up stopped in the middle of the road and one of the funniest lines of all time, John Candy gets out and looked at this wrecked vehicle and says, oh, it'll buff right out. (laughs) Now why do I share this story from a secular and slightly profane comedy. I share it because it's illustrative of how we think and listen and are someday. There are voices that tell us, might be a friend, might be a pastor, might be a parent, a teacher, it might be just something we run into that tells us, hey, you're going the wrong way. And what is our response? How do they know where we're going? Yeah, how do they know where we're going? We just keep doing what we're doing. 
We don't listen to the message. And all of a sudden, as the two semi-trucks stare us in the lane ahead coming straight at us, our life passes before our eyes, and we realize how a fountain of wisdom could have saved us and what fools we've been. Our second passage. Now, I fear that forever you'll connect the... uh, Proverbs 13 to planes, trains, and automobiles, but that's that's the price of an illustration. Old Testament reading today was from 2 Chronicles. Now, if you go to 2 Chronicles, there isn't much joy in reading there. In fact, when people are first exploring what it means to be a Christian or what it might mean to read the Bible. When people are first trying to learn about God, I try everything in my power to talk them out of reading the Bible beginning to end. You start in Genesis, go to Exodus, then you get stuck in Leviticus and you can't get through all those codes and laws, and then you go to Numbers and Deuteronomy and it doesn't get better, it gets worse, and then you go to Joshua and it just seems really bloody and really foreign, and you go to Judges and it gets worse. And then there's First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, and you're hearing about all these wars and these kings who abandoned God and all the judgments and the prophets. This is not a good introduction to Jesus. It's really great material if you know something about Jesus and you have a perspective on what it is you're reading, but it's pretty tough if you're slogging through it from the beginning as someone who wasn't raised up in this. So, just a little aside in my my sermon today, if you are encouraging somebody to get to know Jesus, have them read the Gospel of Mark. Maybe Matthew, but Mark. Maybe John, but they need to be fairly literate if they're going to read John. John's tricky and wonderful. But start there. Don't have them read the Bible from the beginning. Listen to this. Here is one of the kings of Israel, and not just one, but in a whole line of kings of Israel that really, or Judah, that had no intention, no sense of following God who had established the throne in the first place. Zedekiah was 21 when he became king, and he reigned for 11 years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord. He didn't humble himself before the prophet Jeremiah. Now, Jeremiah, pretty important prophet. I think we would have him committed for insanity today, but at the time of Israel, he was very important and communicated profound messages from God about the state of things in Israel to the people of Israel. He also rebelled. This is an interesting, interesting phrase. Did you catch this? Rebelled against King Nebuchadnezzar. Wow. I had never caught that before. Had you, had you caught that before? The king of Israel rebelled against the king of Babylon. Not only did he not submit to Jeremiah or humble himself, but he rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar who had made him take an oath in God's name. He became a stiff neck and, hard, and hardened his heart and would not turn to the Lord God of Israel. Furthermore, all the leaders of the priests and people became more and more unfaithful, following all the detestable practices of the nations and defiling the temple of the Lord, which he had consecrated in Jerusalem. From a biblical perspective, Nebuchadnezzar is judgment, and he comes to Israel and does what he does. He takes away the vessels that are the Lord's from his house, destroys that temple. He takes captives from Judah, Daniel being one of them. And now here it says, he goes to the king, Zedekiah, this is before some of this happened, he goes to Zedekiah and makes him swear an oath on his own God. Now, by the way, Nebuchadnezzar knows something about this God. This is the same Nebuchadnezzar that says, if anyone speaks any word against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, I'm not only going to arrest him, I'm going to kill him, and I'm going to have him cut into pieces and fed to the birds. And this was back in a day when a king could do that. He didn't need to ask anybody's permission. He was the general. He was the high priest. He was the uh, general, I mean, the um, chief justice of the Supreme Court. He did what he wanted to do. Nebuchadnezzar knew who was God. He rebelled against him himself constantly. But when it came to Zedekiah, he made him swear an oath on his own God. And Zedekiah was unfaithful to that unfaithful to God. 
Israel paid the price. But I wonder sometimes, what does it take for God to be heard? How stiff-necked are we? How good are we at hardening our hearts? If you read the story of the Pharaoh, it's a very interesting story because it goes to the debate of freedom versus determination. It goes to the uh, whole debate there. You see, in the story of Pharaoh, when, when Moses first comes to the Pharaoh to say, let my people go, you have multiple times where it says, God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Well, that seems a strange thing to do. God hardens Pharaoh's heart so that Pharaoh will say no to releasing Israel to go worship God, and now so that God can send plagues to trouble the people of Egypt. Very, very perplexing. But in other parts of that same passage, it says Pharaoh hardened his own heart, determined in his heart not to follow what it was that God was asking, what it was that Moses was requesting on behalf of God. Now, this is interesting because Moses has already won the who's the best of the soothsayer contest here. He's won the, the, the magician of the month contest. Do you remember this? He goes before Pharaoh, and Pharaoh's magicians throw down their rods, and they become what? That would have been freaky, huh? Especially in Egypt. We're talking about asps and adders. Puff adders, really ugly and really dangerous. Cobras. I'm out. Thank you. Um, snakes. Moses throws down his rod and they become what? It becomes what? Snake also. But what happens? Good for you. Thank you for knowing that story. That's awesome. Yes. Moses' snake eats up the others. And when he grabs it by the tail, it becomes a rod again. He wins the magic contest. Now, I use that term casually, but I use it advisedly. This is what we would call it. It's not magic in the sense that it's sleight of hand. It's something much deeper. It's on the level of miracle, basically. Moses has proven that his source of power is greater than the source of power of Pharaoh's advisors. Pharaoh has already gotten a glimpse at what, what he's up against, and he doesn't listen. Plague one comes, and he doesn't listen. Plague two comes, and he doesn't listen. Plague three. And I'm not actually speaking entirely fair to the Pharaoh because something would happen, and he would call Moses back and say, okay, just get rid of all of these blasted flies, and I'll let you guys go. The flies would go away, and Pharaoh would go, Life is back to normal. I don't really want to live without all of these uh, people who are providing me free labor here. What is going to happen to our economy? What's going to happen to our country without this labor force? I, I, it's a bad choice for me to let them go. No, I better not. And he changed his mind. Plague after plague after plague until Egypt was decimated. And we're paying the Israelites to get out. How many times are we Pharaoh? We see all the evidence of what it is that God wants of us. We know his power. We hear his voice or his command. We've read what it is he wants of us, and we can't be bothered. Or we agree and we change our minds. Or we feel like for a season we're just not interested, and then we ourselves set ourselves against something. The nature of human beings is rebellion. That's our nature. The essence of what we're about is revolt. There's something about our natures ever since Eden that doesn't want to hear it, that doesn't want to obey, that doesn't want to follow, that doesn't want to listen. We want to be our own people. We want to follow our own minds. We want to have our own ideas. That's all good at one level. I would laud that at one level. But there's also a hardness of heart, a thickness in the head, a slowness to hear. 
When Jesus came, it hadn't gotten any better. I take great, great comfort in the fact that Jesus struggled with communication too. Does that give you any hope? Maybe it gives you hope for your family. Maybe it gives you hope in your job. Maybe it gives you hope in the context of church life where you've been wrestling with something or someone and you guys don't see eye to eye. I don't know. But it gives me great hope. Jesus said it so many times and nobody around him seemed to get it or hear. Jesus himself would say to people, those of you who have eyes, let them see. Well, everybody had eyes practically. Everybody could see practically. But that wasn't what he was talking about. We like to frame it in a very, very difficult to understand sentence. Spiritual things are spiritually discerned. We kind of know what that means. We're talking about spiritual insight and awareness. Same thing with ear. He would say, let those of you who have ear hear. Even John, the revelator, picks that up. Let those of you with ears hear what the Spirit has to say to the churches. Revelation 2 and 3. We're so slow to hear. I'm throwing myself in the rink with all of you. I'm stubborn. I'm difficult at times. As much as I want to be a nice guy, I also like my own agenda. Sometimes I don't want to hear it. Do you resemble me at all? I think you do. You may know me well, and I may not know you as personally as well, but I know some of you pretty well. I'm not alone. Jesus is in John chapter 6, 7, and 8. Go home and read those chapters. They're really tough. He's at the beginning of his ministry. He's working through some miracle stuff, and he's working through some teaching things, and he can't get through. It's an incredibly difficult time for him. And disciples are leaving him in droves. Not the 12, as it turns out. But so many other disciples who had gathered around Jesus, they hear him talk and they don't understand and they are frustrated with what he's saying. They find it odd, hard, weird, impossible. They have no patience for it. And they leave. People in the presence of Jesus who heard him teach who aren't dependent on eyewitnesses and manuscripts and Bibles that tell stories that are 2,000 years old and pastors who aren't always as entertaining as they ought to be. Jesus directly is telling them how it is, and they can't get it. They, they can't hear it. He struggles. Jesus, in John 6, shares with them this, this story. What must we do to do the work God requires? And Jesus said, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. Who's he referring to? Himself. Himself. So they ask him, what sign will you give that we may see and believe you, or what will you do? Jesus has just done a bunch of miracles. He's just done a bunch of miracles. And this is the question, what sign will you give us? That's like saying to Moses, okay, so your, your rod became a snake and ate up all the other snakes and became a rod again. What are you going to do to show me that you've really come from God or that he's sent you? Hello. You're going the wrong way. Our ancestors ate manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. See who we are? We're the children of Abraham, the descendants of those of the wilderness who went to the promised land. We're the inheritors of that promise. We're the people. Jesus said, I tell you the truth. It is not Moses who's given you bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. 
For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. At this point, this is a very slight alliteration because he hasn't come right out and said, I'm the bread of life. And he's not dismissed manna either as coming from heaven. The Father sends manna. Well, he sent the manna in the wilderness and he sends the Son who is the bread of life. Now we're into the, the gray area of double meanings, nuance. And they're literal. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. How convenient. And Jesus declared, I'm the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. Because what is it that is our work? What is it the work of God is? It's to believe in the one who's sent. But as I told you, you have seen me and still you don't believe. All those the Father gives me will come to me. And whoever comes to me, I will never drive away. For I have come down from heaven not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that I shall lose none of all those he's given me, but raise them up in the last day. For my Father's will is that everyone who looks to the Son and believe in him shall have eternal life, and I will raise them up at the last day. Pretty straightforward. So I'm going to give it to you straightforward. This is life, people, that we believe in the one the Father sent. That we believe in Jesus who has been given all authority in heaven and earth. Who has been given everyone who will come to him, not only for this life, but for resurrection to the life to come. You can be saved in every way that it's possible to be saved. In the moment, in the temporal here and now, in this life that we live day to day in community, and in the kingdom of God to come, as we'll experience it in resurrection body life. I am the bread of heaven. I am the bread of life. Whoever eats of me will never, thir never be hungry again. I am living water, Jesus said. Whoever drinks of me will never thirst again. Do we have eyes? Do we have ears? Are we willing to hear when the voice says you're going the wrong way? Are we willing to unstop our ears and quit going, la, 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 I'm not listening to you, like a child? Are we willing to believe? Jesus had a hard time getting through, and life is no different. But let's encourage one another. Let's bless one another. Let's believe together. Let's worship together. Let's love one another in grace and truth, peace and hope. Let's change our world together and make it a place that Jesus might just want to come back to. And now as we have received, let us bless God and let us return to him that which is his already, the tithe, that which belongs not to us. And let us give him our offerings with full, fullness of choice and joy in our hearts because God loves a cheerful giver. The deacons will now receive your offerings.